Hello, I'm Ed Raby, otherwise known as the Rabbit Atheist, a former pastor turned atheist, now a compassionate anti-theist. Welcome to my channel. You're free to like or dislike the video, so please feel free to hit those buttons. Feel free to comment below, and I would appreciate it if you would subscribe to the channel and hit your notification bell for more content as it is released. You're also free to share my videos as much as you like. Um, before I get into the main subject of today's video, which is uh, part seven of the Ten Commandments suck, I do have a couple of announcements. Um, you might notice that uh, the video might be a little bit different. I don't know. Uh, I would appreciate some comments back on this uh, if the quality is improved. Uh, the biggest change that I've done right now is I've switched out my old laptop for a new one. I bought a new laptop. And I'm using its camera uh, for these videos now. I think you can see that the the framing is a little bit different and things like that are already uh, very obvious to me. Um, so I'm going to have to uh, figure out how to, to deal with that. But uh, I really was kind of disappointed in the video quality before and now I'm kind of, uh, I like this a little bit better. So we'll see how this works out. Um, also in the future, I've got, uh, I've got a uh, tripod type handheld uh stand for my phone coming up uh, with a clip and its own little boom mic. Uh, well, not a boom mic, but just a little mic uh, that'll do noise reduction. Uh, one of the things that'll happen probably starting in spring as things get a little warmer, I'm going to start doing a little bit of hiking. And so I'll probably take all that stuff with me, maybe set it up someplace secluded and quiet and do videos besides someplace besides my apartment. So, um, that's kind of where I'm heading with the channel, and I wanted to announce that now, and I'll probably do that again on Friday just to, to double uh, double up on it, just to make sure everybody knows what's going on. Um, but getting back to today's subject, which is the Ten Commandments, uh, and uh, the series called The Ten Commandments Suck, uh, this is uh, part seven, and I'm in Exodus 34 at this point. I've already covered Exodus 20. I'll link... Uh, uh, a card above my head uh, and so that you can go back to the entire series if you wish. Uh, but we're in uh, Exodus uh, 34. I, I kind of did a lot of preamble of talking about all the stuff that uh, happened before in this where, you know, uh, you know, Moses says that these are the two replaced tablets uh, the thing about uh, God visiting the iniquity on the children and the children's children and things like that. Uh, and then you have Moses prostrating himself and offering up the entire people of God to be slaves to God. There's a renewal of the covenant by God. And I got down as far as verse um, 18, where I, I kind of sort of talked about God being a jealous God, where he says his name is jealous, I believe. In other words, you know, he is basically saying, don't make for yourself any molten gods. And then he talks about uh, observing the Feast of Unleavened Bread. For seven days you eat unleavened bread, as I commanded you, as the appointed time in the month of Abib. For the month of Abib, you came out of Egypt. Okay, so what we have so far, as far as commandments, is don't make for yourself molten gods and observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, I want to note, this is completely and utterly different at this point than the original Ten Commandments, quote-unquote, uh, in Exodus chapter 20. And this is a real problem because way back at the beginning of this passage, we need to remember that God says, we're going to make two tablets, you're going to take them up here, or I'm going to write those uh, same commandments that you broke over the golden calf. I'm going to write them exactly the same so you'll have another set of commandments. But already we are so far away from that with just the first couple of commandments or so. Uh, that is one of the problems with the second list. It's difficult to tell sometimes where a commandment starts and where a commandment ends and what constitutes a commandment. So sometimes people count this and it's not exactly 10 commandments all the time. I'm just going through the passage, taking each line and each paragraph as it comes and offering some commentary. Um, one of the things that you know we look at when we look at this is the idea that um, these are very different commandments. And I think there's a reason for that. The reason I think they're different is I think what you had is maybe, I think there's some good historical evidence that a kingdom of Judah existed and a kingdom of Israel. 
And the two of them both went into exile and both went into captivity pretty much together. And they kind of became one people. And what you have is them kind of piecing together both of their legends and both of their commitments and their their different ideas. And because they're so they're similar, they feel that they can present themselves either the king of Babylon or the king of Persia as a unified people. But in order to do that, they have to create this Moses mythology, which quite frankly, could be very much based on, there's like four other legendary characters of the mythologies around the Israelites that Moses could have been borrowed from. So that's something that you have to also consider that what the Israelites are doing here is, is putting this together. The reason I say this now is you're going to start to see extraordinary differences in this group of commandments compared to the original one in Exodus 20. And I think that's because one of them these traditions maybe belongs to Israel and the other one belongs to Judah and they're trying to knit them together and, and put them into a, a similar um, vein, I guess, would be a, a, all into the same book while at the same time respecting both traditions. The problem here with the Ten Commandments is they absolutely botched the job. They absolutely screwed it up because they're completely different. Uh, especially with the narrative that says, hey, you know, I'm going to copy this word for word. Well, that didn't happen. So we get to verse uh, 19, and let's get back to the commentary on this particular set of the Ten Commandments. And verse 19 says, The first offspring from every womb belongs to me, and all your male livestock, and your first offspring from your cattle and sheep. You shall redeem a lamb with the firstborn offspring from a donkey. And if you do not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. You shall re redeem all the firstborn of your sons. None shall appear before me empty handed. Um, this kind of goes back to the whole um, Exodus story. Uh, and remember, we're still in the book of Exodus, and this is trying to put together an Exodus story. And in the beginning of Exodus starts with the Pharaoh trying to kill the Israelite boys, the, the, the men. Later on, the 10th plague becomes killing the firstborn of everything in Egypt, the cattle, everything. Um, hard luck for the animals in this world. Uh, there doesn't seem to be much of a concern for them or their life uh, or the fact that this is very wasteful. Uh, even from a survival standpoint, this is very wasteful. So you need to understand at this point that this is all going back to this history of redemption. And so when we have uh, this coming up, what we see is, okay, we're going to redeem the firstborn male of your livestock from your cattle and sheep. You have to come, um, you have to bring these things to the temple and give them to the priest as a way of redemption. Uh, lambs were an exception, apparently, because you could use the firstborn offspring from a donkey uh, to redeem them instead. Um, and you could uh, change them out. Uh, and if you couldn't redeem it, let's say you didn't have a firstborn of a, uh, of a donkey to redeem your lamb, then you'd have to break the lamb's neck because um, in a sense, what God is saying here, you're either going to redeem these things with the priesthood and you're going to give them something to redeem your firstborn offspring, or you're going to kill it. Um, you're not going to allow the firstborn offspring to live. Now, this is all very well and good when it comes to animals, but you get down to the bottom part and it starts talking about the firstborn of the sons of Israel. That's human beings. Okay, you need to understand that at that point, a man is going to go bend over backward to find some way to redeem his firstborn son. So he's going to, you know, come before God with whatever sacrifice is required. Now, the sacrificial system gets a little bit more complicated, and this is a very basic way of talking about the redemption cycle. So um, there's other ways to redeem your firstborn son. In fact, I believe that uh, Exodus goes into some great detail on how to do this. So it's something to consider in the future. But the one principle that I want to talk about, which I find a little bit abhorrent, is the fact that this even exists. Why do people either have to redeem by paying a bribe to God or by death? Okay, it's one or the other. You either give a bribe to the priest and God or you, or you kill the animal. 
or in the case of human beings, it is possible. If there was no possible way to redeem a firstborn son, what could you do? Well, you might end up killing your son, which is an interesting concept that people, have, you know, people, have, well, I don't think that it's the law is going to do that. That's just immoral and that's wrong. Okay, well, let's fast forward then to Jesus Christ. Is not Jesus Christ the only begotten Son of God, and God doesn't seem to have a problem with killing his own child? I want you to think about that for a minute. And so what this does is it really conditions the Israelites to the idea that children are as expendable as their animals, that until a child comes of age and becomes old enough to think and reason for themselves, they basically belong to their parents and can be expended by their parents any way they see fit. We've already seen that a little bit with women, with daughters. Daughters are basically bought and sold you know, uh, for dowries and so on and so forth. And then you also have now here the firstborn son that all sons kind of uh, find themselves in that category, particularly the firstborn. And then you have the idea that, you know, if you don't honor your father and mother, there's other commandments to say that your father and mother can kill you. So, you know, it's kind of might makes right. We're bigger than you. We're older than you and so on and so forth. The real problem with this is if this is the third commandment, it's completely different than the third commandment back in Exodus chapter 20 as well. Just to, to reiterate, um, it's completely different. Uh, verse 21, you shall work six days, but on the seventh day you shall rest. Even during plowing time and harvest, you shall rest. You shall celebrate the Feast of Weeks, that is the first fruits of the week of harvest, and the Feast of Ingathering at the turn of the year. Three times a year, all your males will appear to the Lord your God, the God of Israel. For I will drive out the nations before you and enlarge your borders, and no man shall covet your land, and shall, so you shall go up three times a year to appear before the Lord your God. Um, well, that's interesting. Uh, with, you know, I have to comment at this point for the 10 central commandments being restated, boy, oh boy, this doesn't seem to be really all that important. We're basically upholding, so far we've uphold the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and now we're going to do the Feast of Weeks, which is the first word of the harvest or Pentecost. Um, and then we're going to talk about the Feast of Ingathering, you know, well, well that's the, 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 the Pentecostal celebration, but it's, we have three festivals that are part of this second 10 commandments and there really hasn't been any moral statement. I mean, if you look at it, I mean, look at this, this is all about religious observance so far. Don't make for yourself molten gods, do the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Your firstborn offspring belongs to me. Make sure you're offering up the proper sacrifices to redeem those firstborn. You won't work six days. You know, you'll work six days and you won't work the seventh as a, a way of honoring me and on, you know, feast of weeks in gathering and three times a year, you're going to appear before me. Now, let's think about that for a minute. It means that every male in, in Israel has to appear before God three times. Now, other commandments basically say, don't appear before God without something to sacrifice, without something to offer. Well, holy cow, if I am a priesthood, now we need to understand what, when you get to the early priesthood in the history of Israel, they're pretty much it. There is no king. Every man is his own sovereign entity. That's what that phrase, every man was right, uh, did what was right in his own eyes really means. It has nothing to do with sin or anything. It simply means that each person has their own sovereignty. Each man, well, each man in that particular case, not each person, has their own sovereignty and is allowed to deal with their property and stuff as they see fit. Well, all of a sudden, you have a priesthood that has the right to three sacrifices, basically, a year, and getting their portion of that sacrifice a year from every male household in Israel, period. That's a good way to maintain a revenue stream uh, for the whole of the tribe of Levi. The whole of the tribe of Levi was absolutely dependent on this, and the priesthood in particular depended on it. You can see at this point right now that this is a pretty good scam to making sure that the priesthood is well supported without having to do one damn thing except religious rituals. Um, I have to admit, this is this is pretty well thought out. Uh, if you have 
this huge nation that's every man is preferring for God three times, that's a pretty good steady income stream. And if you look at the three times, it may very well be this unleavened bread, this, you know, this feast of weeks and the feast of ingathering, you know, uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty good, um, year. Uh, um, I don't know. That's a good way to, to make an income, uh, especially in back in an ancient world. I don't know. I, I, I'm beginning to sense that the, this set of Ten Commandments is more about maintaining the religious priesthood than it is about any moral statement, because so far I haven't had a moral statement in this set of Ten Commandments. There has been no moral statement. There has been a lot of religious commandments forcing a certain religion on people so far. And this is probably one of the great reasons why this set starts to stink really bad, because it's really about religion, not about morality at this point. It's about enforcing a religion at gunpoint, basically. You know, I mean, look at the threats here. You know, up until now, you know, I'm a jealous God. If you don't worship me the way I'm supposed to, by God, I'm going to punish you. I'm going to punish you, your children, your children's children, and their children's children children you know it, it it's going to go out three four generations here and you know and you have all these warnings do all these religious rituals do all this religious rituals do all that religious ritual make sure you're doing these festivals make sure you're doing the sacrifices right none of this is about morality and it seems to me that if this is written by an almighty god if we're going to have 10 commandments, if the first set that I went through in Exodus 20 has a real bad problem with priorities, what does this one have? This one really has a sucky problem with just nothing but religious ritual with no statement of what is right and wrong for humanity to do. It really starts to stink of a religious class creating a group of commandments that keeps them supported. It really does. Verse 25. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread, nor is the sacrifice of the feast of Passover left over until morning. Another religious observance. Okay. Um, when any sacrifice is offered, we're not going to have leaven in it in the bread. Wow. Uh, okay. You know, we're just not going to allow yeast or anything for whatever reason. Uh, I'm not really sure what the point of that was. It really is no disadvantage other than when you use yeast for bread, you get more bread and it's more filling. And that's about it. Um, you will not sacrifice, uh, no sacrifice of the Feast of Pat will left on. In other words, when you do the Passover feast and you slaughter the lamb, you're supposed to eat the whole thing. Everything's supposed to be, there's supposed to be no, after the Passover feast is over, there's supposed to be nothing left. Okay, well, all right. What if you're sick? Well, you got to eat it down. Somebody else has to chow it down. You know, it's, it's, it, once again, this is a religious observance, not a moral statement. So far, I haven't seen one moral statement in the set of commandments, not one. If the Ten Commandments is supposed to be something we're supposed to live morals and ethics by, and this is the only set in the Bible that's actually named the Ten Commandments, it's a pretty weird moral set. It seems actually to be more about religious observance. And that kind of leads me to believe that something else is going on here, not a statement of morality or something inspired by God. Um, once again, Verse 26, you shall bring the first fruits of uh, the first of your first fruits of your soil to the house of the Lord your God. Now, wait a minute. I seem to recall in Genesis, Cain got bashed for basically bringing the fruit of the ground. But when you look at the Old Testament law, grain offerings and fruit offerings and all that stuff are part of the sacrificial system. So we have to ask ourselves the question what this is about. Well, um, don't know other than. Once again, this is a religious observance about sacrifices. We keep going back to this idea of God being a jealous God. So therefore, this is the way to do religious observance to God. Follow it correctly or I'll get you. Okay, that's kind of where this commandment is going and how it works. And so I think that's one of those things that really becomes clear in the second set is that there's no morality here. There isn't any. And yet it is the set that's called the Ten Commandments, not the set in Exodus 20. The set in Exodus 20 is something that we have called the Ten Commandments and made up. I mean, but here we are, 
Okay, um, I'm going to count down here. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then we get to number 10. <clears throat> Um, after the first fruits commandment, you shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. I have never understood the sense of this commandment. Oh, yes, yes. This seems like it would be a great thing. But I'm thinking this is once again more about differentiating the religious rituals of the Israelites versus the religious rituals of people around them. They're just doing something different. And it's all part of the sacrificial system of what they're not going to do. Uh, when you look at some of the sacrificial stuff, stuff is boiled. You know, the, the portion that goes to the priest is boiled and, and handed out to them. Um, so in this particular case, we're not going to boil things in their mother's milk. Um, okay. All right. Big moral statement. That's 10. There it is. Um, I didn't see one single moral statement. Not one. Everything in this set of Ten Commandments is about religious ritual. And that's why it sucks. Because it's absolutely stupid how this works. Because there's nothing here that isn't about religious observance and dealing with the religion called Judaism. It isn't. There's nothing here that talks about morality or what's right or how human beings should live. We just have a jealous God basically saying, this is how you're going to worship and this is what you're going to celebrate. Do it my way or I'll punish you, period. Okay, I'll bless you if you do it. I'll punish you if you don't. Okay, now I'm running a little bit over 20 minutes, but I'm going to keep going because I think I can finish out this one fairly quickly because the rest of it is then said the said the to Mo, the Lord said to Moses, write down these words for accordance with these words, I have made a covenant with you and for Israel. So he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He did not eat bread or drink water. And he wrote on the tablets, the words of the covenant, the 10 commandments. This is the verse that basically says, this is the only set that counts as the 10 commandments. And every one of these 10 commandments has everything to do with the covenant that God made with Israel, and thus it's all about religion, and there's not a single moral statement in this set of Ten Commandments. So when people say they, we need to live by the Ten Commandments of the Bible, the first and most legitimate question is, what are you talking about? Because the Ten Commandments according to the Bible in Exodus 34 has nothing to do with morality and ethics. Nothing. It has everything to do with religious observance. And then now if you're talking about Exodus 20, you can look them in the eye and say, the Bible doesn't say that that's the Ten Commandments. That's something that we've come up with. And that's just true. That's just a biblical textual issue. This is why the Ten Commandments suck. One, which one? And two, the one that's called the Ten Commandments doesn't make a moral statement. It doesn't even talk about morality or what is right and wrong. And people just get it wrong every single time. I want to thank you for coming by today and stopping by and watching my channel. Uh, just a reminder that comments have a way of influencing the content of Friday's videos. I will respond to them when I can. You can also ask direct questions anytime if you're looking for understand something. Uh, my expertise is Bible theology. I have a degree in political science as well as some knowledge of economics and international business. I don't know what strikes your yen in that long list. I'm not an expert necessarily in any of those things, but I do have some good knowledge of all of them. And if I don't know, I can always find out or at least try. Uh, videos are uploaded Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. There's really no set time for that because sometimes I'm working on something a little bit late. Uh, I do these videos when I can. Uh, one thing I don't tolerate is name calling in the comments section. You can demonstrate that somebody's stupid. Just don't call them stupid. You think somebody's a saying something foolish is different than being a fool, okay? Um, there's a lot of people that I think are very smart, but they have certain issues that I think are wrong. And I think that's a good way to do. I don't certainly don't consider myself right about everything either. So it's just a good, humble way of understanding. I, I think when you start name calling, you're just showing that you have a lack of humility about what you believe and what they believe, okay? You have to demonstrate that. Um, 
Be sure to like and subscribe and get your notifications the way you want them. And hopefully I can someday convince you to be a rabid atheist like myself. In the meantime, this is Ed Raby, the Rabbit Atheist, signing off. I wish you a good day and goodbye.